you know, like one of those old Fred Astaire, Ginger Roger, or, you know, Gene Kelly, you know, sing. <laughs> it's raining. Those people go, oh, rainy day. I'm singing in the rain. Just singing in the rain. What a wonderful feeling. I'm happy again. You know, those are happy songs because it's a happy tune that's in your mind and it, it, it just wants to sing, it wants to dance. It's very, very happy. And it's just these, these mundane judgments. And literally, most of the stuff that we learn in our education process is literally learning about illusions. You know, we learn more and more about things that eventually we will need to know about, not at all. You know, I mean, I look at, back at grade school and high school and uh, I guess, I think the only re reason I needed like geometry and trigonometry was to take calculus. Mm -hmm. You take calculus and you, and where exactly, how, how practical is that? If you go off into school, graduate school, then it seems practical, but then you have to at some point start to ask yourself, why do I need all this specialization, you know, when the truth is so simple? Why do I need to know more and more and more about illusions and how, how the illusions work and, and why do I have to get into analysis and synthesis and all this stuff when I just want to be. I really just want to be who I am and be in love. And so, it, you know, you do get to a point where you really have to put it in reverse and just start emptying everything out. Humbling. It's very humbling. And the more that you've learned and the more that you've reinforced, it doesn't do any good to kick yourself or beat, beat yourself up for it, because that doesn't get you anywhere either. But to, you know, work with a system like A Course in Miracles, what it does is it helps you unlearn everything in the most rapid way possible. It's really quite funny that, that we, have a, we have a school system that the ego has created, this, this massive school system. It's one of the biggest industries in the world in our school, you know, school system. And it's teaching us endless amounts of stuff that we don't need. It doesn't teach us that, you know, if you take my, my my daughter is just about to move into an apartment. She doesn't know how to do a budget. She doesn't know how to order a phone line. She doesn't know, you know, there's all these things that she doesn't know. And she certainly doesn't know about forgiveness. She certainly doesn't know about mind training. So you, but she has got all this other knowledge that she will now have to off-learn before she can actually function relatively normally in, in this world. And it's really quite profound that there, that we haven't managed to get these systems in, at least it, it doesn't have to be like completely covering the, the school system, but, but at least that there was a part of it, that there was an opening somewhere where you say, well, this is another opportunity, or this is another way, but the ego has just completely closed that off. Yeah, I think, and they always talk about the, the new generation, you know, the, the indigo children, the crystal children, you know, I have had a, a lot of uh, encounters with the new generation uh, in many ways and it's really spectacular because they, they are reflections of this intuitive wisdom where they just won't even go with those old ways of thinking, like at the end of Solaris, we don't have to think like that anymore. They're just reflecting this new intuitive way where they have a sense that they have all the answers on the inside, and they really aren't going to go through those hoops. They absolutely refuse. Uh, I was talking today to to Jessica, and she was talking about her 17-year-old who absolutely refuses to uh, go with these old ways of patterns of thinking and systems. And she just said that it's her youngest uh, child, but all of the things that work with her other children, or what she thought worked, you know, trying to control them, manipulate them, guide them, uh, teach them how to live and behave and so forth, had not worked with the youngest one. 
And she said, I can't even get angry with him. She said, when I first, when he wouldn't pay attention to what I was saying, I just got really angry, really got, got very, very angry with him. And when I really screamed at him, she said, you know what he did, David? He just put the hand up, like a, like a deflecting shield, like, it wasn't even talk to the hand. It was, you can't touch me with your anger. I'm oblivious to your anger, like here, right back at you, <laughs> but not me. In other words, he wouldn't accept, you know, as Jesus says, anger is nothing more than an attempt to make someone feel guilty. He was simply holding up the, the hand and going, sorry, uh, I will not accept it. I do not accept the anger. You are totally mistaken in your anger and your rage and uh, you better you can choose to get over it if you want, but I'm not taking it on. And you know, that's symbolic of the new generation, the, the indigo, the crystal children. They're, they're reflections of this higher, higher wisdom, you know, not taking things on anymore. And if they have to rebel against society, and they have to re seem to rebel against uh, things, I mean, there have been generations that have, have had the rebellion going on, but but the difference with, the, with these indigo and crystal children is, it's not really a, a rebellion against anything. It's just kind of a wise, oh no, not going there. Uh, not going to pay attention uh, to this meaningless stuff that they're teaching in school because it's meaningless. Uh, not going to mind the, the parents that say, you have to do this or else, the threats. <laughs> She's pointing over at Lynn. <laughs> Lynn was one of those. <laughs> I can't go for that. No can do. No can do. <laughs> can't go for that. You know, it's that's that's where it is. And you know, the, those kind of children end up being the growing up to be like the way showers. You know, you ever wonder, if you look at the lives of the saints and the mystics and the avatars and you kind of follow them through childhood and you follow them through young adulthood and everything and look at their patterns, they are spunky, they are feisty. They, as they, in the Jewish term, they are chutzpah. They are not going to mess around. Uh, oftentimes they, they broke the rules I uh, remember there was a, a Course in Miracles teacher who was a Sikh from India. Some of you have heard of Tara Singh. And he told all those stories when, when he was younger. When he was in India, he, he hated school. He hated education. And so he would always play hooky. Not just one day or a weekend. He would just play hooky continuously. He would he would just not go to school. He would avoid school at every, any cost. And then uh, finally, one day they, they found him, they caught him, they took him to school. And he said he, he sat down in school and he looked at all the children all dressed up and sitting in the desks in the rows and thought it was quite strange, quite conformist and so forth. Looked around and he said he watched the, during the class and waited until the rule was if the uh, if the children had to, to urinate, to go and take a piss, they would raise one finger, and if they had to defecate, <laughs> uh, they would raise two fingers. So he would watch the child and get the permission, and then the child would get the hall pass and go out. So he watched this practice go on for about 30 minutes, and then he raised, and then out, uh, out the door. <laughs> he was not, he wasn't, he just had to catch a little bit of the system to kind of, uh, how do we get the escape hatch? Oh, you just raise a finger or two and then, and then when he went out, he said he, he had a dear, dear grandmother who didn't believe in any of it either, uh, who was like a wise woman in India and she would say, just say to him, come and stay with me. So that's how he could play hooky, he would go to grandma. <laughs> to grandmother's house we go, his grandmother didn't believe in that and then much later, you know, when he came to the United States, he, he was touched by certain uh, deep principles and 
he, he just educated himself based on the things that really lit up in his heart, you know. And that's what kids are doing today. If you really need to know how to do something, of course the kids know today, you don't go digging around talking to adults and digging through books. You just go to YouTube and you type in your search words and then you get a beautiful YouTube that tells you exactly how to do whatever you need to do. And they're in there, believe me. Uh, <laughs> if you need something done, it's as simple as type your keywords in, hit the search button, push, push the play button, and there it is. So it's not this complicated thing of having to have a complicated education. They're starting to use the internet, which is like a giant vault, it's like a library, uh, and there's lots of information, and if somebody really needs to get something done, it's really pretty simple. You know, you get your little how-to instruction video. It's a nice way to live too, you know, just like float along intuitively and then when you think that you have to do something, go get your instructional video, do it, and then get on back to your intuitive flow. <laughs> and In the old days you have to learn something and carry that with you, but now education is really something that happens when you need it. You get all the information that's available to you, it's really just a matter of finding it. Yeah, I, I mean, people have asked if there's like if there's anything we can do with the educational system, or um, if there's anything we can do with anything. I mean, even in Evan Almighty the other day, you know, he he was making all these political promises to change the world, and to me, that's when you come across the course and it says, you know, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. That's when you start to really get the direct wisdom. It's like, it's just saying, don't waste your efforts trying to change the screen. You know, it'd be like going to a movie and there was, let's say, a little glitch in the, in the film or uh, something uh, wobbling in the, in the reel or in the projector and then going and banging on the screen, you know, to try to fix something that needs to, you have to go back into the projector room and get inside the projector. It would be foolish to bang on the screen if if something was flickering. You know, you it would look really foolish to the whole theater if you just went up and started just banging on the bottom of the screen, just saying, "Here, let's maybe come on, can you help me bang a little? Let's see if that we can get this evened out." But because it's obvious that these are just shadows, and why would you tinker with the effects? Why would you tinker with the shadows if that's not where the problem is? But once you get back into the mind, that's when you're getting back into the projector.